Warning. This episode is going full speed ahead into spoiler territory for the Magnus Archives. I'm talking about spoiling basically everything in the show here, so if you have any intention of listening to it, which you should if you haven't already, bookmark this page and book it out of here so you can enjoy the series in its true glory. Also, this episode is going to feature in-depth discussions of fear, in particular as they relate to paranoia, eyes, being watched, and knowledge. As a result, viewer discretion is advised. Oh, and a massive thank you to the Magnus Archives wiki, which was very useful in getting the information for this video together. In case you hadn't guessed, from the hour and a half long video I made earlier this year going over the topic, I consider myself to be a bit of a TMA fan. Now, as a fan of the Magnus Archives, it can be really easy to forget the little details which pop up all throughout the series, given that there are 200 episodes and a truly absurd amount of characters, items, events, and locations, some of which have really easy to forget names. I mean, come on, who remembers the name of Peter Lucas's Lonely Ritual? For those of you keeping track, it's the silence, because Peter isn't exactly the most creative guy in the world. Anyways, with all that information out there, I figured it might be fun to try doing a deep dive on every piece of information from every entity in preparation for whatever new Rusty Quill project is being cooked up at their headquarters. I actually started work on this a good while back, when this video was originally meant to cover all of the entities in one go. Unfortunately, as that project progressed, I realized that making such a massive script was not only a terrible process from a creator standpoint, but would also be unbearably dull to listen to. So, here we are, part one of a 15-part series, where I examine each of the entities in full, listing all of their appearances, the objects and people associated with them, and giving my thoughts on each in turn. I figured that, if I was going to start anywhere, I might as well begin with the Magnus Institute's very own Patron of Fear. Hey y'all, I'm Afton Geek here, and this is Afton Talks, where today I'm going to explain the eye from the Magnus Archives. Real quick, as a small YouTuber, I'm basically obligated to ask you to subscribe. Only 1.2% of my viewers are subscribed, and subscribing really helps the channel. It's totally free takes only a second, and if you click the bell next to it, you can be alerted whenever I upload a new video. Alright, that's enough shilling for one video. Let's get some eye contact. The Eye, also known by the names Beholding, The Ceaseless Watcher, and It Knows You, is, as mentioned earlier, the arguably most central entity to the story of the Magnus Archives. The Eye watches over fear related to information and paranoia generated from the fear of being watched or exposed, especially in regards to secrets. The Eye is also made up of the fear of being followed, though that is somewhat shared with the hunt. Often, those affected by the Eye are taken by an intense drive to seek out knowledge, even at the cost of their own well-being. All of these fears end up manifesting within the eye as security cameras, vigilant observers, and, obviously, eyes, real or fake. The eye also has a particular focus on areas of knowledge, such as libraries or, perhaps, archives. Now, as far as characters associated with the eye go, it can be a little hard to pin down what exactly counts here. Given that almost everything we see in this story is through the eyes, pun intended, of the Institute, almost everything has shades of the eye. However, there are certainly specific characters which are tied to the eye in an important way. The first up on this list is, of course, Jonah Magnus. Jonah is an avatar of the eye, who has been around for quite a long time. In fact, as you may guess from his name, Jonah was the founder of the Magnus Institute, and has acted as its head for many years. Sticking around for hundreds of years has a tendency to attract attention, though, so Mr. Magnus picked up a handy talent to help deal with that problem. Body swapping. By removing his own eyes and placing them in someone else's head, he's able to fully take over their mind and body, allowing him to always keep a watchful eye on the Institute through the generations. Richard Mendelssohn is the earliest non-Jonah body that we know of, although there's surprisingly little to go off of there. 
After Mendelssohn, Mr. Magnus passed on to James Wright, who took the position in 1973 and was head of the Institute both when Peter Lucas first met Mr. Magnus and for most of Gertrude Robinson's tenure as head archivist. Finally, Magnus took Elias Bouchard, the charming gentleman in today's drawing, as his new body. Elias would remain as Jonah Magnus' body until their deaths at the hand of Jonathan Sims in the final episode of the series. Alongside this neat technique for avoiding detection and that pesky aging business, Jonah Magnus possessed a number of useful skills. One of the most helpful is his limited omniscience, which allows him to know almost any piece of information or see any event, as long as an eye of some kind is present. However, it also requires focus, which means that he has trouble knowing information while he is distracted. This knowledge proves to be very useful in tandem with Jonah's next ability, which lets him plant information in the minds of others, something which he frequently uses to torment his employees. He also seems to be able to call John to him as shown in 158, which the Magnus Wiki has dubbed the Watcher's Call. That name is awesome, and I'm keeping it. On top of all that, Jonah may perhaps be able to magically doctor CCTV footage, or he might be really good with editing. Oh, and he'll kill everyone in the Institute if he dies. I think that's everything about Jonah, which is great because that took up over half a page in the script and we really need to get a move on. The next most important person in the Institute is the Archivist, a rotating job which allows the person assigned to it to take statements. The earliest archivist we know of, if we're not counting the nameless archivists who get referenced in the Serapeum and which haunt the tunnels post-change, is Angus Stacy, who we know basically nothing about save for the fact that he was finally done in by a smiley monster called the Grinning Wheel. Fortunately for us, Stacy was followed by Gertrude Robinson, a metal as hell old lady who lived basically her whole life in the Institute, pissed off almost all of the fear gods, disrupted tons of rituals, wore plenty of cardigans, committed serial arson, and managed to get all of her assistants killed, and then was shot by Elias while trying to burn down the Institute. As I said, metal as hell. After Gertrude, we unfortunately land on our protagonist for the series, Jonathan Sims, head archivist of the Magnus Institute London, not to be confused with Jonathan Sims, head writer for the Magnus Archives and voice of Jonathan Sims, head archivist of the Magnus Institute London. Unlike Gertrude, John was inept as hell and got himself into plenty of dangerous situations, including falling in love. He was so bad at his job, in fact, that he ended up causing the end of the world. It would take me about 200 episodes to explain all of the escapades of the Archivist, so I think they can best be summarized by the time he was kidnapped by two burly delivery men and dragged to a wax museum where a plastic clown aggressively moisturized him while he was on the run for murder and dealing with a crazy door demon. Because the Magnus Archives is a comedy. Now, after the Archivist, the next layer down are the Archival Assistants, which there are a lot of because archivists seem to be really bad at keeping their help alive. As a result of the truly absurd amount of them, I'm going to be giving each of them one sentence each. It's rapid fire archival assistant time. Martin Blackwood is a lonely little man who likes tea and the archivist. Sasha James got almost no screen time and then was replaced by her evil funhouse mirror twin. Timothy Stoker was an office clown who got harassed by clowns and then blew up the clowns. Basira Hussein was the good cop to Alice Daisy Tonner's rabid, violent, murderous dog cop. Melanie King used to be a YouTuber until she got shot by a ghost and gouged her own eyes out after failing to kill her boss many times. Michael Shelley was a trusting idiot who got eaten by a door. Eric Delano got married to a psychopath and skinned. Emma Harvey liked seeing if she could kill her fellow archival assistants until she was the one in the burning house. Fiona Law couldn't keep her eyes open and somehow that kept things from killing her. Finally, Sarah Carpenter certainly existed until she got turned to ash. All right. That didn't take anywhere near as long as I expected. The only other employee of the Institute worth naming is Rosie Zampano, who was Elias' personal assistant and got trapped in the Panopticon post-change. Next up is the Key family, descended from Albrecht von Klosen, which included Mary Key, who had familial ties to the eye but seemed to prefer the end, and Jerry Key, who had eye tattoos all over his body and worked with Gertrude. Both of them ended up as skin in a book, though. 
There's also sparksfly.com, which might be connected to the eye given how intrusive it gets on personal information, though I'm not sure exactly how much you can consider a website a person. In fact, it might be more effectively considered an item, which luckily for us is the next category. Unlike the characters, this section should actually be pretty short, since there aren't a lot of artifacts associated with the eye. The first object to appear under the eye is a peculiar hand mirror. Staring into this mirror will reveal a creature watching the holder from behind. Even after the mirror is destroyed, the creature's presence will linger with the person in question, giving them the constant sensation of being watched. Next up is an instruction manual, which is a little peculiar because it contains pictures of the reader within its pages. Don't spend too long examining those pictures, though. Extensive reading of the manual will grant the reader the ability to become one with the security system, seeing from its eyes as though they were cameras. That's probably backwards, but I'm leaving that in because that's funny. Finally, there's an eye that's been carved from rock, which has the ability to disrupt cameras and video. While this ability can be mitigated by leaving the rock in a black velvet bag, I imagine this item would have been quite useful if John ever thought to use it against Elias. With the eye's items out of the way, we can now move over to the locations associated with the eye. Perhaps most obviously on this list is the Magnus Institute, with the archives in particular being a focal point of the eye. Given that the whole purpose of the Institute is a thinly veiled cover for taking stories of fear created by other entities and using them to feed the eye, I think its role could be considered pretty intrinsic to the needs of beholding. Venturing deep into the tunnels of the Institute, we find the remnants of Milbank Prison. Used as the key location for the Watcher's Crown, the Panopticon in particular has very strong ties to the eye, being used as the central stronghold for the eye post-change. Interestingly, we actually know of two separate sister locales for the Institute, those being the Usher Foundation located in Washington, D.C., and the Pusongling Research Center in Beijing. Both of those bastions of the eye are assumed to work fairly similar to the Magnus Institute London, but we don't really get a good look inside of either for their process to be known well. There's also the Serapeum of Alexandria, which seems to have been a precursor to the Institute as we know it today, and the Tomb of Johann von Rutenberg, I definitely said that wrong, which is covered in enough books and eye symbology to drive any archivist mad. The eye is interesting, because it's the only entity we know of where we have two very elaborately laid out rituals. The first was called the Watcher's Crown, and was performed by Jonah Magnus in the 1800s. With Milbank Prison's Panopticon at its center, John tried to bring the eye into the world in full. While it obviously didn't work, Jonah did manage to get some nifty abilities for it, which I think is a fair trade. Don't worry though, Jonah would get another try at this whole ritual thing in 2018 with the Mass Ritual, also maybe known as the Magnus Archives depending on who you ask. With the failure of his previous ritual still heavy on his mind, Jonah realized that any ritual trying to bring through only one of the things that were fear would be destined for failure and immediately began working on a ritual designed to bring them all through at once. Having taken a little time to set up this entity percent speedrun, he picked Jonathan Sims as the core of this new ritual. By orchestrating scenarios with a little help from the web, in which the archivist could be marked by every fear, Jonah was now ready to bring about the end of the world as we know it. By tricking John with a little magical hello John, apologies for the deception, but I wanted to make sure you were still reading, so I thought it best not to introduce myself, Jonah Magnus managed to split the world into hellish segments called domains. Speaking of which, while not exactly locations, the post-change domains ruled over by the eye are something that we'd want to chronicle in order to get a full idea of what the eye actually is. Now, arguably, all of the domains show shades of the eye because of the way that the post-change world is structured, but going over every domain would take a lot more time and energy than I have at my disposal right now. Right off the bat, we get into a bit of a weird spot. You see, the cabin that Martin and John begin Season 5 in is arguably a domain, and it certainly does seem to have enough of the eye in it to classify as that. But it feels weird to think of a two-person eye domain which only affects the people who are completely unaffected by every other domain. In the end, I decided to include it purely because I knew somebody would bring it up in the comments if I didn't, so just feel free to argue about it down there. 
Please keep things civil though. Now, as the season goes on, what entity each domain serves gets a little messy, so I'm just going to include all of the ones I think could serve the eye. The Necropolis has a number of elements of being seen, known, and being forced to relive trauma, all of which are common throughout the Eye's manifestations, so I think it's fair to say that the Eye has a hand in its torture. The monument is almost entirely driven by a need to know and discover, which is a very Eye-like drive, so I'll count it there. There's the prison, which feeds on the fear of being mistakenly punished for a crime you know you didn't commit, and Martin's Domain, which feeds on the fear of being too unimportant to know. Oh, and there are endless files somewhere that might be associated with the eye? Finally, at the center of this whole mess is London, which has been entirely overtaken by elements of the eye. Cameras? Check. Paranoia? Check. Suspicious neighbors? Check. Eyes in your walls? That's a check. Weird old men you hate growing out of your arm? That's quite the unpleasant check, but a check nonetheless. Standing tall over the entire world is the Panopticon, a giant tower of one-way mirrors where Jonah Magnus resides as pupil of the eye, until his place is taken by John in the finale moments before the entire structure is implied to be destroyed, originally part of Millbank Prison after the change it served only to torment everyone on planet Earth. Now if that isn't a promotion, I don't know what is. Finally, it's probably worth taking a little time to talk about where the eye falls in relation to other entities. Now it does seem like a lot of the entities want the eye to fail, and that's because they do. I'm sure that there are plenty of age-old feuds between powers like the Dark or Stranger and the Eye, but I'm equally certain that just as many enemies were made by a certain serial arsonist old lady and her silly tattooed partner who had no idea how to dye his hair. Given that the Archives have, in some way, disrupted rituals for the Flesh, the Buried, the Spiral, the Lonely, the Desolation, the Stranger, and perhaps unintentionally the Corruption, this should not be a surprise. This is all without mentioning the web, who has its own ambitions and, as a result, is about as willing to help the eye as it is to stab it. Really, the only true entity we see allied with the eye is the lonely, and it's hard to tell how much of that is because they're similar ideas, and how much is just Jonah and Peter going out for lunch one too many times. Now we get to the fun part, the analysis. The Eye is an interesting entity because of how passive it is. While we see a few avatars and items pop up here or there, outside of the Institute, the Eye seems perfectly happy to just sit back and watch, which is very on brand for the so-called Grand Voyeur. While most entities seem to have a cult or merry band of monsters to send hunting after someone they don't like, the eye mostly just waits for the remnant fear created by other entities to trickle its way back to them. The eye is also really interesting on a metatextual level, because of how effectively it acts as a stand-in or metaphor for the audience. As enjoyers of horror, most of us don't want to see characters end up in a better place than they started, having happily moved on from their trauma. We want to dwell on it, we want to see them reflect on the things that haunt them. We want to see their fear. That parallelism makes it really easy to understand the eye and its intentions, because it really is just a step up from all of us. We know a lot more than the characters, we see everything that happens, and we're just sitting back, taking it all in, incapable of helping as tragedy drags them along a well-choreographed dance. It's interesting to think about, isn't it? Keep that in mind the next time you watch a horror movie or read a scary story. You're the eye, the one watching from the corner, waiting for the downfalls of the characters you already know are going to happen. With that comforting thought, we've reached the end of our exploration of the eye. What did y'all think? Did I get everything? Feel free to comment what entities you want to see me tackle next, and I'll be sure to give all your suggestions a look over. Sorry, I needed to get one more pun out before I brought this video to a close. I really hope you enjoyed this examination of our ocular overlords, and I'll see you all back here for the next part. Good night, y'all.